Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will start the lesson today, the discussion today. And let me first remind you that this Wednesday, this Wednesday, uh, April the 14th, we will have test two. And this test too covers from uh, conditional probability counting techniques. counting methods and then random variables the mean and standard deviation binomial distribution and Poisson distribution. Okay, and in our last informal class which was on March the 31st on March 31st I did recording we have recording for or some previous tests let me see let me see where is that <clears throat> what did we cover on that day? So on March the 31st, yeah, March 31st. So you can see the recording on that day. Uh, we cover fall 20 and spring 20 test two. Okay, and then I also went over uh, spring 19 and spring 17 test two with East LA College. Okay, the recording for this ECLA College one, you can see from here. Now the recording for you, of course, you can see from our Zoom. Okay, I noticed that there's one of you still show your work from, I don't know who taught you those methods uh, when you do your quiz, but this is the way you look for it. You know, you go to the Zoom and then you go to cloud recording and you go to this March 31st, there are two files there, you click on that one, then you will see the recording, that's the video, and this is the audio, okay? So you can see uh, what I went over there. This is the one I went over with uh, your class on March the 31st. Let me play that here. Okay, and then uh, going back to that discussion, if you want to see what I went over with my uh, Friday's stats class at East LA College, then you can click on this one here. Okay, so in total, these two classes went over four different sets of test two. Okay, and Yes, on that March 31st, it's supposed to be my day off. I spend two hours, I think two or three hours for that. Okay, and for my ELEC Friday class, it's supposed to be my day off also. I spend another two or three hours, actually three hours with them, I remember. So three hours with you, three hours with them. Uh, let's see. Yeah, two hours, 53 minutes. <laughs> yeah, two hours, 56, uh, 53 minutes. I remember that because then after that, I took off, went to Vegas. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, so I hope, I hope 
uh, you do much better in this test too. Okay. Uh, of course, if you don't put enough effort in that, then your expectation will not be high enough if you don't put enough effort. Okay. If you put enough effort, then uh, the, the amount of effort you put in is linearly corresponding to uh, your expectation, of course. Okay. So the recording for math, uh, March 31st, uh, you can see on Zoom. second recording C zoom and then go to event recording uh, what's the name again let me see cloud recording I think yeah cloud recordings Okay, and then you see the one uh, March 31st. Okay, now, and then for the one from East LA College, uh, to see the recording, see, see discussion on. On March 31st. Okay, the one I showed you earlier. Okay, and uh, I also have the solution written in, in PDF. Okay, so, so if you already start working on that yourself, you can compare the solution with what I have here. Okay, compare with what I have here. Now, I strongly, 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 strongly suggest you to do it this way. Okay, glad uh, you get the blank test. So fall 20 blank test is here. Okay, if you want to get the other ones that I went over, you won't go back further on March 29th. I believe I post some there, the old tests, right? Okay, so there are four blank tests uh, posted. Now try to do one, actually I want you to do all of them. Okay, but you do, let's say that fall 21st, Okay, do it on your own and time yourself. You have only two hours to do those problems. Okay, so the one here, okay. And then compare with the solution here. Okay, now I strongly suggest you before you start everything, you watch the video first. Okay, if you want to skip all the lesson that I went through, okay, and you think that you are smart enough that you can follow, at least do this. What I don't want to happen is uh, to repeat what some students did to me in your test one. It's like, I teach you one thing and then you show me another thing and it's totally wrong. The sad thing is that you don't even know it's wrong and proud, proud, proud enough to submit it and say, I did okay. I think I did okay. I didn't know that I did. I didn't know how can my grade be that bad. It's like, hey, you know what? I can tell you didn't watch my, you didn't follow my lecture. Okay. And because of this class, Studying next semester, I will require my students to attend the class. You know, no, I don't want it happen anymore. It's like, you're supposed to be here anyway, right? Uh, anyway, uh, that's for your test too. Now, I appreciate some of you already here. Uh, and oops, I'm supposed to show this earlier. Yeah, yeah, this is the take the blank test, print it out and work on that. Okay, and then compare with my solution. Okay, if you want to get the spring 20, you may need to go back to uh, March the 29th. March the 29th, I post a spring 20th, a spring 20 blank test. Okay, you print it out and then you compare with the solutions that I post on March 31st, okay? Now, if there's anything that you don't get, uh, you may want to watch the recording, okay? Now, the solutions for spring 19, spring 17, also here, and the video, you can find it here. The blank test, you look back to uh, March 29th, okay? Basically, then if I summarize, if I summarize, take a look on the discussion on March 
29th, you will see the blank test. Okay, on March 31st, you will see solution for fall 20th and then spring 20th. Okay, and that's from our class. And you have spring 19, spring 17 uh, from East LA College. So you have four sets. Now, when you practice, practice with these sets. And I strongly suggest you to actually study from the, the most recent one, the last one year. Okay. The way I will write my test will be very similar to those two. I basically uh, upload whatever I have from, let's say, fall 20, and then I change the number here and there, and then I make it a new test and send it to you as a, a, new, a new test, your test too. Okay, such that if you don't do well in this test, I really just like, oh, you know what, you don't study enough. Okay. Oh. Uh, what I will do first today, I will go over our last quiz, quiz five, six, seven. I really thought I have the solution already and I figured out, oh no, I didn't have the solution. So let me just go over the solution with you. And after that, I will start chapter seven. Now, chapter seven will not be in your test two. Chapter seven will be in your test three. Okay, chapter, uh, your test two will be up to Poisson distribution. I believe that's uh, 6.3. This is section 6.3. This is section 6.2. This is section 6.1. This is section 5.6 or 5.7, I don't remember, maybe 5.4. And conditional probability, I think that's 5.3. Yeah, question mark. Okay, basically start from conditional probability. Okay, let's start with this uh, spring 20th, uh, 21st, our quiz that you turned in last Saturday evening. Okay, solution. Let probability of A is 0 0.4, probability of A given B is 0 0.8. Let me write down the formula first. Probability of A given B is probability of D intersection over probability of the condition. While probability of B given A is probability of D intersection over probability of the condition. Now, we are given probability of A, probability of A given B, probability of B given A. Those are the one given to us. Now, then uh, from what we see there, from what we see there, oh, you know what? To find pr probability of the intersection, I will use the one here. I will use this one. Why? Because there are three ingredients in this equation, in this formula, and we know two of them. Okay, so probability of B given A is equal to probability of D intersection over probability of the condition. Then I will plug in numbers. That's 0 0.6 equals to probability of A intersect B over probability of A, which is 0 0.4. Then 0 0.6 times 0 0.4, that's probability of D intersection. So that's 0 0.24. Okay, now then you notice that once we know probability of the intersection, then we know this guy, right? I can use then the first formula to find probability of B. Okay, so probability of A given B is equal to probability of the intersection over probability of the condition. A given B is 0 0.8. Probability of intersection is 0 0.24. 
So 0 0.8 times probability of B is 0 0.24. Probability of B is 0 0.24 over 0 0.8. Hmm, I wonder what's that? Is it 0 point? Is it 0 0.3? I think 0 0.3. That's 0 0.3. How about the probability of the union? The probability of union is probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of D intersection. We have all the ingredients for this. Probability of A is 0 0.4. Probability of B, that's 0 0.3, we get it from part B, minus probability of the intersection, 0 0.24. When we compute, we will get 0 0.46. That's the probability of the union. Now let's go on. <clears throat> part D. What is the probability of outside of A but inside of B? That's probability of all B minus probability of the intersection. Okay, inside B but outside but outside of A, right? So you take everything in B first and then you kick out, you uh, subtract the probability of the intersection. Probability of B is 0 0.3, probability of the intersection is 0 0.24. That is 0 0.06. And how about the probability of B given not A? That's probability of D intersection over probability of the condition. That's the probability of conditional probability. That's the formula for prob conditional probability. Now, probability of not A but B, we already get it in part D. Probability of not A is 1 minus probability of A, which is 0 0.4, as I remember. Yeah, that's, yeah, probability of A, 0 0.4. I have a question coming in. And then that's uh, 0 0.06 over 1 minus 0 0.4. That is 0 0.06 over 0 0.6. That will be 0 0.1, I believe. Okay, now that's for uh, this uh, page one, number one. Now, the number of points I give here is a, a lot smaller than the actual test because this is a take-home quiz, right? So I don't give you that much, uh, uh, that many points. In your test, uh, you can expect part A will be three points, part B will be three points, uh, part C will be two, part D will be two, part E will be two. Or maybe just all of them are two points. It's possible because we do this so often already such that uh, you should know what to do once you see the problem. Okay. <clears throat> now let's go on. Number two. The following Venn diagram describes the number of elements in A, B, A, B, and C. Leave your answer in decimal. Suppose one student is randomly selected from the box Find the probability of A given B, knowing that person is in B. So let's find out first how many elements in B. Uh, in B, there are, this is this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Those are the numbers of elements in B, right? So that will be 25 plus three plus five plus eight. 25 plus three plus five plus eight, that's 41. There are 41 element in B. Now of those in B, how many of them also in A? 
of this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. How many of them in A? You know what? Let me let me actually answer it this way better. So uh, 25 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8. Of these 41 elements, how many of them actually in A? The one also in A are 3 and 5, right? 3 plus 5, there are 8 elements in A out of that 41. I'll leave your answer in decimal. So 8 over 41 is 0 0.19512, five decimal places. If I don't say anything, then leave it in, uh, uh, but I want you to write it in decimal, then write it in five decimal places. Now, how about not A, but in B? Given that it is in B, what is the probability it is not in A? Well, if you think about it, they're supposed to add up to one with A, right? Okay, so those in B, those in B, uh, how many not in A? It's uh, 25 plus eight, not in A. 25 plus eight, not in A. That's 33 over 41, which in decimal, it will be, 0 0.80488. 0 Let me check. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I don't need this. Uh, part C, what is the probability it is in B knowing it is outside of C? Outside of C are this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Those are the ones outside of C. So 31 plus 29 plus 3 plus 25. How many are those? That's 60, 88. There are 88 elements outside of C. And how many of them inside of B? Inside of B, there are uh, 3 plus 25, right? That's 28. Now, 28 divided by 88 is, that's 0 0.31818. OK. <clears throat> Now, let's see part D. Suppose three students are selected, are randomly selected from the box. So we have three students, okay. Find the probability that exactly two of them from A. Find the probability that two of them from A. Now, if you take a look on that fan diagram, compare with what they want, we basically see that that box, that fan diagram consists of those who are in A and those who are not in A. Is it right? Now let's see how many elements in A. The number of elements in A are 29 plus three plus five plus seven. That's 39 plus five is 44. So there are 44 elements in A. Now, how many elements not in A? That's 31 plus 42 plus eight plus 25. Those are the number of elements not in A. It's 5106. So there are a total of 150 elements here. So this is 106. Now, what is the probability exactly two of them from A if you select three students? Uh, two from A means two from A and the other one not from A. The probability will be 150 combination three. That's the number of ways to select three students or three people from 
uh, this box. Okay, this group. Okay, and how many ways can we get exactly two of them from A? That's 44 choose two times 106 choose one. That's the notation. Uh, then let's compute. 150 choose three. That's 551,300. Uh, 44 choose two. That's 946. 106 choose one is 106. So 946 times 106 divided by 551300 five, give me zero point we want it in decimal right zero point one eight one eight nine that's the probability okay. around eighteen point two percent in decimal. That's the probability to have exactly two elements from A. Part E, what is the probability to have at least one element from C? Uh, at least one uh, from C means that's the complement of non from C. That's the complement of non from C which is one minus probability of non from C. Okay, so let's see, we will take a look on that box, how many from C, how many not in C. Okay, but, but we know we, it will be 150 choose three at the bottom here. Okay, now, now let's see how many elements in C, number of element in C is 42 plus eight plus five plus seven, 50, that's 62. Give me a second. Uh, so there are 62, elements in C, uh, then the number of elements not in C will be 150 minus 62. I think that's 88. Yeah, we have it here actually, right, 88. Wow, then what is the probability that none of them from C? None of them from C means all three are not from C. That's 62 choose zero, times 88 choose three. Okay, focus on that first. Okay. Ask yourself, can you come up with that in the test if I ask that question? Okay, you can also do it one by one, by the way. Uh, uh, in fact, you had this question in your test one. Okay, you can do one minus Okay, how many elements not from C? 88, so you do 88 times 150, uh, over 150 times 87, over 149 times 86, over 148. You will come up with the same answer. Okay, yeah. So we, we had that question in our test one. It's very similar question. We can call that the same question. Okay, now at that time we didn't have combinations to compute, now we have that. So you can use either way in your test. Yeah, you can use either way. Okay. Uh, having this combinations method uh, enable us to do more problems than what we had before. Okay, But it doesn't mean then all of a sudden what we learned before cannot be used anymore. No, there are cases that we still can use it. Like in this case, the one I showed you earlier, right? You can do it that way. Okay, now 62 choose zero is one, 88 choose three, what's that? 88 choose three is 
109,736 over 551,300. Let me see what's that. So divide it by 5, 5, 1, 300. That's 0 0.19905. So when I subtract, I will get 0 0.80095. So approximately 80% chance we have at least one element from C if we select three elements from that box at random. Okay, now that's for page two. Let's go on to page three, the hardest one. A box contain ten, contains 10 identical markers, uh, three black, I mean five black, three blue, and two red. Uh, three different markers are selected. What is the probability of selecting at least one red marker? Probability of at least one red. Now, uh, notice that it is without repetition because of these three different markers. Okay. In fact, even if we say th uh, three markers are selected, it means three different markers. Okay. It means without repetition. Why? Because if you put that back without replacement, because if you replace that, there's a chance you select three markers, but you end up with only two markers because two of them uh, repeated, right? Okay, so the understanding is when they say three markers are selected, means you need to get three markers. Not one marker selected three times. No, no, we should avoid that possibility. Okay, three markers are selected. Okay, what is the probability at least one of them red? At least one red means one minus probability no red. Right? One minus probability of no red. Okay, <laughs> my, my daughter wants to play with me. Uh, what is the probability of no red? Okay, well, we look at our containers right now. They are two red and eight not red. If you select three, and you get no red, you select three and you get no red, this is what we get, right? Okay, so we get two choose zero times eight choose three over 10 choose three. That is one minus, uh, what is eight choose three, 56. 10 choose three, 120. So that's one minus 56 over 120 is what? 0 0.46667, which is 0 0.53333. Now, since I didn't say uh, what the solution supposed to be, either in decimal or fraction, you can just leave it in fraction if you want. Okay, you can just leave it in fraction. So this is one minus 56 over 120. This is 120 minus 56 over 120. Uh, that will be 64 over 120, I believe. Uh -huh. 64 over 120. I can reduce by eight, I believe, eight over 15. Yeah, okay. Oh, with that said, and I, I now remember that uh, thanks to Adrienne, that I make a mistake in one of my work last time, uh, one of my solution last time. I subtract that incorrectly. I miss one, number one. I miss one, number one. Uh, what's that? Uh, let, give me a second. Let me think where I can find it. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it's this one. Yeah, I think it's this one. 
uh, fall 20 number eight. I make mistake here. I make a mistake here. This is correct. Up to here is correct. I make mistake here. It's supposed to be 195. It's supposed to be 195. Okay, should be 195 over 220. So my computation, of course, after that will also be incorrect. Okay, so this will be negative 975. Uh, negative 975. So this should be minus 1385. Okay, so everything else here should be corrected. Thank you, Adrian. I, I was not, when, when you asked me that question, I was like, what kind of silly question is this? Can you just see that it's one minus 25 over 220? And then when I when I see that again, say, like, oh, hold on, <laughs> something not right. <laughs> something not right. I was missing a one there. And that's crucial though, that's crucial. Okay, because this this if this one is wrong, like if I don't have that one there, then they don't add up to one. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so thank you very much. That's a very big correction actually. Oh, that's well, a very, very big. Not question. on purpose. I was just trying to understand. <laughs> well, well, uh, that, 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 that's how I know that you actually study, yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. Mm -hmm. There, in in the past, I there were times that I purposely just leave my answer. I like for this one here, mm -hmm. I correct that in this class, but I will not correct that with my uh, my Friday class. Why? Because if they study, they will see my mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, right? And they 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 should be able to correct me instead. Yeah. Okay. So, but uh, thank you. I mean, there are times that I knew I make a mistake. I just leave it like that. But yeah. this time, I didn't realize that. I have to be honest. I didn't realize I make that mistake. Are you yeah. texting us outside of the test, Professor? To see? If... No, I'm just kidding. Re repeat it again. <laughs> well, you're welcome. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? If you if you can find my mistake in this tedious work here, then very likely you will do fine in your tests for this part. I, I, I think I said it before. I said it before. This this type of question in my test two is considered the hardest one. Oh, okay. You know, so if you can find my mistake here, mm -hmm. even though it's just computation mistake, but then the consequence, you see, all these reds here are the consequence. Well, that's what <laughs> happened to me on the um on the first test because when I was um count I left off the lower limits. I wasn't fully understanding the lower, the upper and the lower limits. Um, uh -huh. and, um, counting, uh, you know, including it inside of the um, the p, uh, not the p, inside of the um, the x value, not the x value. I, I'm not saying it right, but I counted. They're yeah, basically it the outlier. In the, exactly, and I and I and it it just messed the whole thing up. So that's mm -hmm. why I was very particular on making sure that I follow your lead, and that's how I noticed mm -hmm. that. <laughs> It was a simple mistake that messed up everything. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Okay, now this one, uh, you found it out for me such that I correct that here. Uh, not a long time to spend, but that's crucial to fix. Yeah. Okay, so I do the square root here. I get forty three point two two five four. Oh, what am I doing? 43.2250. Okay. Uh, you know what? Let me save this and then uh, update my, my file there. Give me a second. Uh, what's the name of this again? Uh, that was... I think that was Math 227. This one, huh? It's that one. Fall 20. Mm -hmm. yeah, let me upload it again. Let me show you what will happen. So I need to go to my file folders 
and then delete that one. Oh, where's that? Not here. It should be here. It's fall 20 test two solution, huh? Fall 20 met two solution. So I delete first this and upload the new file. Okay, let's check if it's already fixed. That's our discussion on March the 31st. last page yep it's already updated yeah, let me update the one from my east la college also just in case just in case Maybe mm. someone wasn't brave enough to say something. I was just confused. <laughs> hey, no, 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 no. Hey, uh, no, don't don't think yourself that way. If you study, uh, you uh, how, how to say it best? Uh, if you study, then you have the right to ask question. <laughs> yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. If you study, then you have the right to ask questions. You know, uh, no, you put effort in there. And of course I will appreciate that, you know, and if I make a mistake or even if you think you are the one making mistake, go find out uh, what uh, you can do better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, no. The only time that I say that you uh, don't ask me such silly question if you don't study, you know, I have to be honest to be to, uh, with you though. At that time, when you asked me that question, I really thought I went over that really clear during the lecture. And but because it's you asking that question, I say, uh, you know what? Let me see what I was not clear enough. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then when I saw that again, oh, uh, wow, I was the one making mistake. Good that you asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure you see us making those kind of mistakes all the time. So, yeah. <laughs> Yes. I didn't expect me making that mistake. <laughs> well, you know, that's, not a time it that's algebra mistake, you know. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> that's algebra mistake. Let me see my announcement with them. Yeah. Yeah. If I don't fix it now, then uh, very likely. Oh, I didn't upload the recording yet with them, huh? I should. Uh, I wonder if, where I put the recording. I do that during the break. Yeah, and now let's come back to you. Now let's come back to you. Okay, so I'm done fixing that part. Let's come back to our class here. So that's the probability of getting at least one red. Uh, part B, what is the probability of getting blue markers first and then two black? So let's, oops, sorry, wrong color. Huh. I want that in blue. So we have uh, five black, uh, three blue, and then two red. Now, what is the probability to get the blue first and then black and then black? Probability to get blue first is three over 10, right? There are three blues out of 10 markers. Now, then after you take one blue out, uh, how many black we have? We have five black out of? Uh, two. Mm -hmm. Out of you took one, you oh, took nine. one blue out. I'm sorry, nine. out of nine times. And after you took one black out, how many black left? There are four, four black left out of eight, eight. right? Okay, now this will be 60 over 720. 
uh, reduce by 10, reduce by, reduce by 12. So that's one over 12. Okay, you can actually, if I were you, I will do this kind of canceling. I prefer to do this kind of canceling. Uh, I mean, from your arithmetic, right? This is this is one out of two. This is one out of two. This is one out of three, right? Yeah. So you get one out of 12 easily. So you can't do the, the three combination one, two, five combination two, because it doesn't, um, because the combinations, why, why, I, I just need to, I remember listening to you, I was just actually going over um, your Poisson um, explanation and your binomial explanation of what the differences are between those two, but what's the difference between using the combinations and then just reducing yeah. it myself? Okay, so your question basically, why not using combination? Yeah. Good question. Why not using combination? Now, what do we know about combination? Well, you're reducing from a group of, of numbers and then you're using that probability, right, against. There's one key ingredient in combination uh, that makes it different from this case in part B the ordering. Oh, okay. Yeah, combination is not, in combination case, order is not important. Okay. Yeah, order is not important in combination. In combination. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, while in part B, combination, uh, the order is important. Now, the good thing about if the order is important, it means you can just do it one by one. Mm -hmm. Like blue first, what's the probability, and then black, what's the probability, and then another black, what is the probability like that? Okay. Okay. That makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. now, uh, part C, find the probability of getting one black marker. Now, notice that here, they don't say... Uh, that one black marker is the first one or the second one or the third one, just one black marker. In other words, the order doesn't matter, right? So we have five black markers and five not black. To get one black markers, it means the other two, We uh, remember, we need to get three markers, right? The other two is not black. That will be five choose one times five choose two. The five choose one comes from here. Five choose one. And the five choose two comes from five not black, you choose two of them. Divided by the total number of ways to select three markers, that's 10 choose three. Five choose one is five, five choose two is 10, 10 choose three is 120. That's 50 over 120, that's five over 12. Is it okay? Why is it five choose two and not five choose three? Uh, the five choose two in this blue one here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, notice that we select three markers in total. Yeah. Right, so that will be 10 choose three. That's the 10 choose three. Now, if one of them black, if one of them black, it means if one of them black means the other two of these three markers has to be not black. So the five choose two actually coming from five not black choose two of them. Okay. Uh, maybe I emphasize it this way. To say that we select one black, it also implies we get one black and two not black. So from the group of black, five black markers, you select one of them. From the group of not black, you select two of them. That's the number of ways to get one black. 
Okay. Okay. I did that on D, but I didn't do that on C. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what uh, I was thinking. I don't uh, know. I, I, I think. <laughs> I think I think I purposely make it like that though. So in part D, you don't do too much, like uh, because in part D, uh, that's the distribution of the number of black markers, right? So let X be a number of black markers. Then this x may be zero, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three. But the one, we already did that in part C. Probability that x equals zero uh, means if you have five black and therefore five not black, uh, probability of no black means the other three is black, uh, is not black. Right? That will be 5 choose 0 times 5 choose 3 over 10 choose 3. Is it okay? If no black selected means the other three are not black. Right? Okay. Now, a probability that the number of black selected is 1, it's already computed in part C. So that's the same way you will get 5 over 12. Okay, maybe I leave it as 50 over 120 for now. Yeah, I will reduce that later on. Okay, but uh, yes, uh, it's already done in part C. Okay, now probability that two blacks selected will be five choose two black, five black choose two, five not black choose one over 10 choose three. And lastly, probability of uh, the number of black selected is three means five choose three times five choose zero over 10 choose three. I think that will be exactly the same with this guy. So this is one times what? Five, four, three, that's 10. This is 120. So this is 10 over 120, that's one over 12. I can reduce this to five over 12. This is 10 times five over 120, 50 over 120, that's five over 12. And this is 10 times 1 over 120, that's 10 over 120, that's 1 over 12. Now, when you reduce it, because you know you will need to compute the expectation, right? So when you reduce the fraction, make sure you keep common denominator. Okay? Yeah, make sure you keep common denominator. Now, then I will go on constructing the probability distribution and extend it later on. So this is my x, that's 0, 1, 2, 3, and the probability, that's 1 over 12, 5 over 12, 5 over 12, 1 over 12. Now make sure when you do probability, they, they add up to 1. Okay, this is 12 over 12, which is one. That way we confirm it is a probability distribution. Now then to compute the expectation, P times X, this is zero, this is five over 12, 10 over 12, three over 12, that's 18 over 12, which is 1.5. Now the expectation, the number of uh, black markers selected on average is 1.5. Okay, now then the second extension x squared px squared that's 0, 1, 4, 9, 0 here, 5 over 12, 
20 over 12, 9 over 12. What's that? 14, 34 over 12. Which is, let me reduce it. That's 17 over 6. So the variance of this x will be 17 over 6 minus the expectation square. Let me use my calculator. 17 divided by 6 minus 1.5 squared give me the decimal 0 0.58333. But that's not the question though. The question is standard deviation. Okay, so standard deviation will be the square root of that number, which will be 0 0.76376. Okay, now I go over this spring, uh, this quiz here, uh, because uh, this will be the main part, at least one third or maybe one half. Now I should say one third of your test two on Wednesday. Okay, these are uh, one of the main ingredient of your test too. Okay, of course we have binomial distribution, we have uh, a Poisson distribution, we have hypergeometric distribution. Uh, now I never really mentioned explicitly hypergeometric distribution, but hypergeometric distribution is this thing. This thing here, this is hypergeometric. Okay. The name is quite scary, such that I don't really use that terminology, you know. Okay, so in the last ex, uh, problem, this, this thing we did here, this is the probability distribution of a hypergeometric distribution. Okay, but the word hypergeometric, like even the word geometric is already scary for a lot of you, right? Okay, when you hear the word hyper, that's actually discouraging. That's why I, do, I try to avoid using that terms too often. But that's actually hypergeometric distribution. That's the first distribution you learn in this class, implicitly, without me giving it a name. Okay. Oh, I hope uh, that's good enough. Any question, by the way, from here? Let me save it. This is Matt two two seven zero four twelve twenty one uh, spring twenty one Matt two two seven quiz five six seven solution. And let me post it on your quiz. Give me a second. Let me post it on your quiz. I think I'm quite lucky this semester uh, that I teach two statistic class, two statistic classes and three pre-calculus classes. So uh, basically only my calculus two that is not repeated. The nice thing about that is like I can write uh, one test and being used by two or three classes. Let me post it here. That's Matt 2007, this one. I show you this so that you see the inner working of uh, a canvas from a teacher's point of view. Okay, that's the solution. Notify users that it already changed. That's when I try to show that I already post the solutions. Okay, let's go back to ours.
Now let's start with a new material. The, this new material chapter seven is not in your test two, but it will be in your test three. Okay, that's uh, 7.1. Now our textbook uh, covers a lot of things which I don't think is necessary. I want to cut to the chase. Okay, now 7.1, our textbook uh, going over consists of uniform distribution, uniform distribution. And intro to normal distribution, intro to normal distribution. In my lecture video, I don't think I went over uniform distribution. Okay, and I will keep it that way that this uniform distribution will not be in any test, any quiz. I never asked that question about uniform distribution, but today, this time, I will explain it a little bit, but the purpose is to bring us to the notion of normal distribution. Now, instead of explaining intro to normal distribution, uh, I will explain standard normal distribution instead. which our textbook actually explained in 7.2. So let me say this again, okay? Uh, I can just skip this 7.1 and just go ahead to 7.2, okay? Now, instead of explaining 7.1 uh, like our textbook, I will explain uniform distribution, not that I will ask that in any one of my test quiz or final, but to lay down the idea of continuous distribution and help us to understand standard normal distribution better. Okay, now let me start. We will talk about continuous distribution. Continuous, continuous distribution. So this is the part you don't find in my previous lecture. <clears throat> Uh, we had learned hypergeometric distribution. Binomial distribution. And Poisson distributions. in chapter six. Now those are discrete distribution. Uh, what is that Thomas? Uh, what is discrete distribution? It's the that the outcome, the X will be numbers like one, zero, or one, or two, or three, or on, and on. Now, it doesn't have to be integers, it may be negative, okay? But in our hypergeometric distribution, the question was like uh, the probability of no red markers, the probability of one black markers. So the outcomes for the random variable X will be zero or one or two or three and on. We don't even have 3.5, we don't have 2.7. So discrete distribution, uh, a random variable is discrete if the outcomes are this type of outcomes in which you can easily find two outcomes, let's say one and two, and there's no outcomes in between. There's no such thing called 
no 2.5, no, no 2.27. Okay, we call that a discrete distribution and discrete random variable. If you can find two outcomes, you can find two outcomes such that there's no outcome in between. Between two and three, there's no outcomes. Okay, that's how I define discrete distribution. Okay, so informally, I will say it this way, informally, A uh, random variable is discrete is discrete if we can find two values of the random variable. such that no value in between. Okay, now the difference between discrete random variable and continuous random variable is there. Okay, continuous random variable is when we always can find a value between any two value you choose. Let's say for example, let's say for example, if we talk about let x be let x be the height of a person okay now you can find somebody who is 5 feet tall you can find somebody who is six feet tall, but even if you have five feet and six feet, you can easily find, you can easily find somebody with the height, any number in between. Let's say you say, oh, you know what? I want somebody with five feet, uh, seven inches. You can easily find somebody with that height. Okay. And even if you find somebody five feet, seven inches, uh, you still can find somebody in between these two numbers, right? Like five feet, 10 inches, that's my height. Okay, anytime you pick two numbers, anytime you pick two numbers, anytime you pick two numbers, two possible outcomes, okay? There's an outcomes in between. You see what I mean? Okay, now if you can, if you have that kind of situation, anytime you pick two numbers, uh, outcomes for that random variable, you can find a number in between, then it must be continuous. Okay, now it's different from discrete random variable. Okay, like the number of children, for example, uh, some family have two children, some family have three children, but you cannot find anybody with two and a half children, no way. Okay, yeah. Uh, so that's what we mean by continuous random variable. Now, here's the thing. Because we have continuous random variable, the way, the way we compute the probability of a continuous random variable okay. 
is by finding the area under the density curve. Now, let me explain it first using uniform distribution. Okay, let's say the following. So, so again, the following things is something I have not done any time in the last, <laughs> basically in my career. This is the first time I try to explain uh, how we compute the probability of a continuous random variable uh, using density curve. Okay, now if you think this part con uh, confuse you, you can skip this part. Okay, I will spend approximately 20, 30 minutes on this. But if you get confused with this, again, if you get confused, you can just ignore this explanation. But uh, on the other hand, I try to instill in you uh, the idea of the idea of probability equals to area. Okay, now, and for that, I will use uniform distribution as a stepping stone. For example, let X be uniformly distributed. The notation is U from let's say zero to 10. Uniformly distributed means the probability for that event to happen any time between 0 to 10 are exactly the same at any point. In other words, in other words, that, you know what, let me use other color. In other words, that this is the density. <clears throat> the probability it happens between zero to one, let's say, let's say the bus can come anytime in the next 10 minutes. Okay, let's say X is the time it takes the bus to arrive. Now, uh, the probability it happens between zero to one minute is the same to the probability it happens between one to the second minute the same to probability that it happens between the second to the third minute. Okay, that's what we mean by uniformly distributed. Okay, now then, <clears throat> we want to associate the probability with the area under the curve, knowing that the total probability of any random variable, as we have learned before, the total probability under this curve has to be one, which means if the length is 10 here, if the length is 10, what will the height be such that the area of this yellow rectangle is equal to one? Okay, the area, the total area is equal to one. Now we know the area of a rectangle is base times height, right? The base is 10, the height is h. So the height here is one over 10. The total area under the curve has to be one. Will that be always one over 10 times? No, that's not true, okay? That's not true. It's not always one over 10. Uh, you will see that in a uniform distribution, the length of the base is reciprocal of the height because what? The product has to be one. 
Okay, so if the length of the base is six, for example, then the height will be one six instead of one ten in this case. Now, the probability, let's say this is uh, the time for the bus to show up, okay? the probability that the bus comes between zero to let's say six minutes from now, from zero to six will be equals to the area, this is equals to the area under the curve between x equals to zero to x equals to six. Okay, so if we see this rectangle here, now the area associated to that event will be this area up to six. Okay, now what is the area under that curve between x equals to zero to x equals to six? That is the probability. Okay, that will be the length at the base is six, the height is one over 10. That is six over 10, which is 0 0.6. Okay. Now, Let's do another one. How about the probability that the bus will come between two to nine minutes from now? If the bus arrivals is uniformly distributed in the next 10 minutes, what is the probability that it shows up between two to nine minutes from now? So you are finding what is the area under the curve between two to nine. What is the area under the curve? Okay, that's the probability for the bus showing up between two to nine minutes from now. Now, what is the, the probability? Now, let's see, what is the length of the base? That's nine minus two, right? Nine minus two times the height is one tenth. That's seven over 10, 0.7. That's the probability for the bus to show up between two to nine minutes from now. now. This is the notation for uniform distribution. Again, I told you earlier that you don't need to worry about uniform distribution to show up in your test. So you don't need to worry about the notation. However, if one day you decide to take uh, psychology further into psychology, especially social science, uh, or higher probability statistic, then you definitely see this notation here. I'm not making up this notation u parenthesis zero to 10 like that. No, that's the notation being used for uniform distribution. Okay, now let's try more, let's try more. I hope you can imagine this. And again, if you don't feel good with this, don't worry, you can just skip right away to 7.2. But I hope you get it though. Let's see example two. Let X be uniformly distributed from three to 12. From three to 12. Which means you start from three, you end at 12. You start from three, you end at 12. Okay, it looks like a rectangle. Okay, now what is the length of the base, by the way? Anybody can help me? How long is this ruler if you see from three to 12? That's 12 minus three, right? That's nine, that's the length. Now, if so, if the length is nine, 
Can you tell what is the height? The height must be the reciprocal, one over nine. Again, because the product length time space has to be one. The total area under this rectangle, the total area under this curve has to be exactly one. So part A, what is the probability that uh, the X is less than, let's say five? What is the probability that X is less than five? So take five on that number line. Let's say this is five. Less than five refers to this section here, right? Now the probability that X is less than equals to five is equal to the area associated to that interval. Now then, what is that area? What is the length of the base from three to five? That's five minus three, right? Times the height one over nine. So the probability that X is less than five will be two over nine. Let's see part B. What is the probability that X is greater equals to seven? Greater equals to seven. So you get seven on the number line, maybe <clears throat> somewhere around here, seven. Uh, greater than that, greater than that to the right of that. Now the probability that X is greater than seven is equal to the area of that shaded region. That is a rectangle, the shaded region is a rectangle. The base is 12 minus seven, there, that's the length is five, while the height is still one over nine. So that is five over nine, that's the probability. Okay, so by the way, uniform distribution is actually one of the easiest distribution in continuous distribution. Okay, now, uh, so Thomas, if it is the easiest, why don't you ask that in our test or in our quiz? I can, but I just, I feel like uh, there's no need for us to uh, focus too much on this. We rather focus on standard normal distribution. Okay. Now let's do one problem from our textbook. Let me see from our textbook. Or even our textbook is not uh, actually emphasized on, on this though. Okay, uh, give me a second. I copy paste from number 18 in our textbook. This is 7.1 number 18, 7.1 number 18. The reaction time X in minutes of a certain chemical process follows a uniform probability distribution with X between five to 10. So you imagine five to 10, five to 10, from five to 10, five to 10. What is the length of the base? The length of the base is 10 minus five, that's five. So the height will be one fifth. Okay, so this X here, let me write the notation. X is uniformly distributed from five to 10. 
okay? Part A, draw, draw the graph of the density curve. That's the density curve. Part B, what is the probability that the reaction time is between six and eight? Probability that X is between six and eight. from six to eight approximately here. Now the probability for that event to happen is equal to the area under the density curve. The area under in that rectangle, the one I shaped, okay? Now notice that the length of the base from six to eight is two, while the height is one fifth. So the probability is just two fifth or 40%. Okay. Now then part C, what is the probability that the reaction time is between five to eight? Between five to eight. Or definitely they can just say less than or equals to eight because it starts from five, right? By default, okay, between five to eight. Now the length of the base is from five to eight is three, multiplied by the height is one fifth. That's three fifth. Now, part D find the probability that the reaction time is less than six minutes. Less than six, but it has to be between five to 10, right? So less than six means from five to six times the height one fifth. So the probability is just one fifth. That's it, that's for uniform distribution. Okay, now I will replicate the idea that the probability is equals to the area into standard normal distribution, 7.1b, standard normal distribution. A normal distribution has density curve as the following. First, it's bell shaped. It's bell shaped. Uh, roughly, it looks like this. So it looks like bell. It's bell shaped. Second, it's symmetric. With respect to the peak. which is the, the average, which is the mu. So the peak here, that's the average, that's the mu. And it is symmetric. So you can, you can graph this uh, bell-shaped curve, right? And then you fold that along this dotted line, then the left and right will meet. Okay, that's what we mean by symmetric. Third, the area under curve the curve is one. OK? 
Okay, now that's all I want to say for now for a normal distribution. Our textbook put more detail about what they call standard deviation. is equal to the distance from the mu to inflection point. This point here. Uh, what is inflection point? Inflection point, is, the word inflection point is actually a terminology from calculus. Inflection points is the point where the curve change from concave down becomes concave up. Or concave up becomes concave down. So like, like this is what we call concave up. Concave down looks like this. This is concave down. Uh, a better definition is the following. This curve is concave up. If, if you pull a line between two points, the line will be above the graph. If you pull a line between two points on that curve, then the line will be above the graph. Then that's concave up. Concave down, if when you pull a line between two points on that curve, the line will be below the graph. So the one with the uh, green highlight here, that's concave up. The one with the blue highlight is concave down because when I pull the line, it is the line segment is below the graph. Okay, now I purposely uh, set it aside here because it's not important for you to understand it this way. Okay, you need to understand it this way if you are going to a very theoretical statistic. Okay, but for now, we just see, say that, oh, you know what? There's a something called standard deviation. What is that standard deviation? Oh, that's how it actually moves from the mean to one standard deviation. From the mean minus one standard deviation. Okay, but what you really, really need to know for now is that the mean is at the peak where the peak happens and it is symmetric. The area under the curve is one. Now, standard normal distribution. I, we talked about normal distribution earlier, right? We talked about normal distribution earlier. There are infinitely many normal distribution. There are so many normal distributions. However, when we talk about standard normal distribution, the standard normal distribution denoted by capital C is a normal distribution with mean one, I'm sorry, with mean zero and standard deviation one. Standard normal distribution is so important in statistic and probability. It's so important, so, so, so important, such that statistician and probabilist give capital C for its random variable. This is the only distribution in probability and statistic that gets a special notation, capital C. And capital C, therefore, cannot be used for any other case, any other random variable, or even any other notation. Let me say it again. 
capital C is only used to describe standard normal distribution. That's how important this distribution. Okay, we have other normal distribution, but once it is standard, then we use capital C. Okay, now capital C, standard normal distribution, is a normal distribution which is bell shaped. Ah, sorry, which is bell shaped. The peak is at zero. Okay, and the inflection point has one unit away from the mean. While the area under the curve is one. Okay, we use capital C for that. And we do not use capital C for any other random variable anymore. Okay, now capital C therefore can be said as normal distribution with mean equals zero and variance one squared. Now you will see later on uh, after the break that normal distribution has the notation capital N parenthesis. The first number is the mu, the second number is the variance. Okay, now standard normal distribution, the mean is zero, the variance is one. Okay, now uh, I will take, uh, I, give, I will give us a break. When we come back, we will work on standard normal distribution and normal distribution. Uh, but before I let you go with the break, let me say first in my announcement that I already post the videos that you need to watch uh, up to test three. Okay, so lesson 14, watch this before Monday. Okay, uh, lesson 13, which is not in your test two, it's already in your test three, but it's something I expect you to watch uh, before uh, March the 31st. Okay, so my lecture today is related to lesson 13. Okay, it's related to lesson, lesson 13. It's not in your test two, it will be in your test. Okay, so if you want to see uh, the lecture part, then you go back to lesson 13. Even though what I believe I have done here is uh, basically uh, lesson 13 being described another way. Okay, now after the break, we will start working on standard normal distribution. We will talk about, after the break, we'll talk about the probability notation and the calculator notation. And how to punch that, how to use calculator. Okay, that's what we will do after the break. Uh, big, 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 very big warning from now on after test two. Material, our lesson will run really fast. Not that I make it fast, no. No, you will see uh, once we once I lay down the important uh, concepts, like in this case, probability notation, calculator notation, how to use calculator. Once you know how to do that, 
we basically done with 7.2 and 7.3. You see what I mean? Okay, and then uh, on Monday, when you come back, we will work on chapter eight. And next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, uh, 12, uh, nine days from now, we will start working with chapter nine, maybe. Okay, it, it runs really fast. It runs really, really fast. Why? Because nothing, no, there's not a lot of things that we need to learn. We just need to learn these things and then apply that into word problems that we get from our textbook. Okay, now let's take a break. We come back at 5.50. Okay, let's start again. Uh, I said earlier that after this, uh, the material for test two, basically starting from this normal distribution, then the material will run really fast. Uh, it's not because I want to make it fast. No, it's just because that uh, the material is quite simple such that all you need to do is actually practice. But the practice, the word practice is the key. Okay, so besides working uh, with me, uh, in our discussion, you also need to work that out at home, okay? Uh, how to say it better? Uh, you need to get used to it, okay? You need to get used to it. Uh, it's not something you can just uh, see that and you know what to do right away. You need to get used to it, okay? You need to get used to it, but not nothing much to say, really. Nothing much to say. Uh, let's start with this. Uh, uh, let z be normally distributed with mean zero and variance one. Okay, <clears throat> now let's take a look first. Give me a second. I want to get something from internet. Uh, this is the standard normal distribution. And the mean is zero. The curve actually goes infinitely far to the right and to the left. But the area under the curve is still one. Now, then here's the thing. Suppose, for example, uh, we have that standard normal distribution, right? Uh, and we want to find part A, find the probability that this, the probability that the outcome, this C will be between, let's say, uh, 1.2 to 2.5. From 1.2 to 2.5. In other words, my curve later on will be from 1.2, that's to the right of z, uh, z equals to zero, right? To 2.5. The probability of that event is equal to the area under this curve. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Now then, how do we do that? Calculator notation will be normal CDF. Write it down first, normal CDF. I will show you that on our calculator later on. And then the first two numbers, the first two numbers are 
the lower fans and upper fans of that interval 1.2 2.5 the third number is the mean zero the fourth number is standard deviation one okay this is the mean this is the variance but if the variance is one it means the standard deviation is also one right this is the mean this is the variance that's the mean that's the variance okay so normal cdf will be followed by four numbers the first two numbers are lower bound and upper bound of the interval. That's the lower bound, upper bound of that interval. The third number is the mean. The fourth number is the standard deviation. Because it's standard normal, because it is standard normal, then the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. Now, how do we punch using our calculator? Grab your TID four. How do we punch our calculator? It you still go to distribution, second distribution, and you see the second option is normal CDF. Normal CDF. Now the lower bound in this case is one point two. The upper bound is 2.5. The mean is zero. The standard deviation is one. And you paste it. So you will see this will be your calculator notation. Normal CDF, the first number 1.2. The second number 2.5. The third number is zero. The fourth number is one and then you press enter. So the probability, which is the area under the curve is 0 0.10886, 0 0.10886. Probability notation, calculator notation, then calculate the result. Okay, now you try this, you try this. How about the probability that the standard normal uh, random variable will be between negative 2.1 to 1.7? And to help, you may want to sketch the standard normal distribution first. The mean is zero, right? Negative 2.1 is to the left of zero, negative 2.1. 1.7 is to the right of zero, that's 1.7. Okay, what you need is this area under the curve between those two Z's. Is it okay? <clears throat> now then, how about the calculator notation? Now take a look on that curve, okay? Because we are computing the probability of normal distribution, we will use normal CDF. Okay, the lower bound to upper bound, that's the first two numbers. Okay, negative 2.1, the lower bound, the upper bound is the second number 1.7. The mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. 
Are you following me? Then calculator. Go to normal CDF. Lower bound, negative 2.1. Oh, by the way, when you punch negative, do not use subtraction sign, no. The negative, you should use this one here. The one next to enter. Negative 2.1. The upper bound, 1.7. The mean is zero, the standard deviation one, and then you paste it, enter. That will be 0 0.93757, 0 0.93757. Okay. <clears throat> so far so good. Okay, let's go on. What happened if we don't have lower bound? Let's say, for example, I want to find probability that Z is less than equals to negative uh, 1.84. Negative to the left of negative 1.84. Now let's take a look first on the standard normal distribution. You don't need to sketch this graph all the time, but I think when you study during this weekend, I don't expect you to study between today and Wednesday. I don't expect you to study this between today and Wednesday. I want you to study for your test too. But after Wednesday, after you're done with your test too, then you study for, you study this material, right? Okay, now uh, then uh, sketch the curve first, okay? Oh. Z is to the left of one point, negative 1.84. So if I have negative 1.84, I need something to the left of that. Which means my interval is from negative infinity to that one. Right, from negative infinity to negative 1.84. The problem is, but, we don't have negative infinity on our calculator. So we will replace that. We replace that. maybe to be more precise, we replace negative infinity by negative 10 to the 99. Okay, but how do we punch negative 10 to the 99? That will be negative E 99. Okay, we will replace that by negative E99. Uh, it has something to do with scientific notation. If we write 10 to the 99 in scientific notation, our calculator will see that as, you need to type it as E to the 99. Now I will show you how to get that E. Okay, oh, let's write the notation first. This is normal CDF. The lower bound is negative infinity, which I will replace by negative E99. The upper bound is negative 1.84. The mean is zero. Standard deviation is one. Now let's see our calculator. 
that's normal CDF, normal distribution, right? And then you go to normal CDF. Now, how to type negative E99 on your calculator? The negative is the one next to enter. Now, the E is here. You see the comma here? You see double E here? That's the one you use. Okay. Even though I will punch that double E, but on my screen, it will show up just E. Do you see that? That's negative E 99. This means negative 10 to the 99. Okay, to get that double E, uh, you use second comma, right? And then punch 99. The upper bound is negative 1.84 as usual. The mean is zero, standard deviation one. Zero point zero three two eight eight. Zero point zero three two eight eight. Now let's see again the calculator. Okay. Now let me ask you to try this then. Let me ask you to try this. Please practice now. If you have question, ask me now. Find the probability that C is less than 2.17 to the left of 2.17. So if this is my uh, standard normal distribution with mean zero, okay, 2.17 is to the right of zero, but I need area to the left of that. which means the interval will be from negative infinity up to 2.17. Now then how about the calculator notation? Normal CDF. <clears throat> The lower bound, negative E 99. The upper bound, 2.17. The mean is zero, standard deviation is one. Then we use our calculator, normal CDF. Okay, now let me show you again how to uh, type, how to punch that negative E99. The negative has to be the negative sign, not subtraction sign, negative sign. E is the one, the second of that comma. Now, even though they write a double E there, E, E, but when you punch it, you get only one E, okay? 99. That's the lower bound to replace negative infinity, right? And then the upper bound 2.17. The mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. You paste it, you will get 0 0.984996. So it's actually 0 0.98500. 0 0.98500. Zero, zero. If we round, we, if we round it to five decimal places, okay. <clears throat> now let's go on. How about then? If I want to find the probability that the C standard normal distribution is greater equals to 1.25. Greater than 1.25. 
greater equals to 1.25. Let's take a look on the standard normal distribution curve. This is zero because it's standard normal. So the mean has to be zero. 1.25, that's to the right of zero. And you go to the right, greater equals to that. Means the interval will be from 1.25 to infinity. Is it right? The lower bound is 1.25. The upper bound is infinity. Now, how about the calculator notation, normal CDF, lower bound, 1.25. The upper bound is infinity, but I don't have infinity. I will replace that by E99. The mean is zero, standard deviation is one. That will be second distribution. That's then you go to option two normal CDF. Lower bound 1.25. Upper bound E99. E99. By the way, not this E. Do you see the, the one above uh, deficient sign? Not this E, not that E. Even though the result very likely will be the same, but it's actually not this E. This E is base 2.72. This E that we use here, it's the for uh, scientific notation base 10. So when we type it this way, E99, that's 10 to the 99. If you use this E here, this the one here, I hope you, you see that. If you use this E here, that's 2.72 to the power of 99. It's very big number, but not as big as 10 to the 99. Okay, enter the mu is already zero. The standard deviation is already one. Go on, boom, 0 0.10565, 0 0.10565. So the only new things from part C, D, E is we replace infinity by 1099 we replace infinity by 1099, which on our calculator, we use that E99, okay? That's the only new thing. Now, what happened here is, what happened here is we try to find, so far A, B, C, D, E, we try to find the probability if we are given the interval. Now, the next question is to find the C-score. Call that part F. Find the C-score, let's call that Z, such that probability that C to the left of that C-score is 90%. That's new, it's totally different. It's the other way around. We know the area to the left is 90%. What is the C-score? Now we know that this zero is the midpoint. That's the axis of symmetry such that the area to the left of that zero is the same to the area to the right of that zero Okay, but because the air, total area under the curve is one, then the area to the left of zero is equals to one half. The area to the right of zero also equals to one half. Now, what it has to do with this question? Now, in this question, in this question, we want to find the C score C what is this C here? What is that equals to such that the area to the left of that is 90%. So instead of knowing the upper bound, lower bound, 
finding the probability. Now we know the probability. The probability to the left of that number is 90% or 0 0.9. What is that C? Okay, if the area to the left of that is 90% and the notation will be C equals to inverse nor parenthesis 0 0.9. Oops, sorry, comma zero comma one. Okay, now this guy here is always area to the left, always area to the left, always area to the left. If you use inverse norm, then the number, there are three numbers, right? Now, then the first number is the area to the left. The second number is the mean. The third number is the standard deviation. Okay, now where do we find inverse norm? Inverse norm is the, uh, right below normal CDF. Inverse norm is located right below normal CDF. Now the area here, always area to the left. Okay, when you use inverse norm, then the first number always area to the left, 0 0.9. Okay, the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. Enter 1.28155. So 1 1.28155. So that's the C score. What is that number this C such that the area to the left of that is 90%? That's 1.28155. Now, the thing is what happened if what they tell us is the area to the right. If what they tell us is the area to the right, we need to adjust a bit such that we get the area to the right to the left find c such that probability that c to the right of that c is let's say 0 0.6 let's picture that first What is that lowercase c such that the area to the right is 60%, 0 0.6? But again, uh, our calculator cannot find the C score if the area is to the right. You need to make it area to the left. Okay, this is the area to the right. Okay, you need to make it area to the left before you use your calculator. Okay, but if the area to the right is 60%, 0 0.6, what will the area to the left be? one minus 0 0.6, which is 0 0.4. Okay, that implies probability that Z, standard normal distribution is less than equals to that C, that's the blue part, is equal to 0 0.4. You need to do that adjustment first. Okay, now then from there, C is equal to inverse norm. The area to the left, 0 0.4. The mean is zero, standard deviation is one.
Then we use our calculator in first norm, 0 0.4, the area to the left, the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one, negative 0 0.25335 negative 0 0.25335. And it makes sense because uh, from our picture here, we see that the C is to the left of zero. Okay, now for you to practice at home later on, uh, this will correlate to question number five to number 17. Yeah, five to number 17. Suggested homework from this 7.2 from number five to number 17. So I already uh, uh, dive into 7.2 also. Okay, call that 7.2a. Okay, the key is really sketch the graph. Use that picture to help you figure out. <clears throat> now, in the next couple minutes, maybe 10, at most 15 minutes, uh, I will do the general normal distribution. Let's say, for example, let x b so it's not standard normal it's just a normal distribution but it's not standard uh, the mean is 100 and standard deviation is 15. i will use 15 squared here because that's the notation for the variance normal distribution is followed by the mean and the variance however in our calculator the last two numbers is always the mean and standard deviation, not variance. The mean, the same mean, standard deviation, variance. Okay. Now then, suppose I want to compute what is the probability that X is between 80 to 110 from 80 to 110 the mean is oh i'm sorry what did i do the mean is 100 okay not zero anymore this is not standard normal distribution it's just normal distribution non-standard normal distribution now we want the area between 80 to 110. So the mean right now is not zero. The mean is now given to us as 100. Now we want to find the area here. Now then we follow the same pattern we did it earlier. That will be to find the probability of a normal distribution, we use normal CDF. And then lower bound to upper bound. Lower bound is 80, upper bound is 110. The mean is not zero anymore, the mean is now 100 and standard deviation 15. Okay, let me code it. The first two number is lower and upper bound. The third number is the mean. 
The fourth number is standard deviation, not variance. See, the thing is like, you need to get used to it to memorize how to use your calculator. Okay, students who don't do well in my test three, most of the time are those students who they may already say uh, okay with test one and test two. It means they have the brain, they have the, the discipline, but they didn't study. Okay, because maybe it's because too easy such that they, oh, you know, I know how to do this. And then during the test, they forget how to use their calculator. Either then they ask me how to use calculator, which we, I will not answer during the test, or they try to go back to their notes, but it will take them too much time. That's why they won't do well, because with the time I give you for your test three, you won't have enough time to finish the test and study how to use your calculator at the same time. No, there's no such thing. Thomas, if you don't give us that many questions, we should be able to do it. Well, the thing is like, if you have study, then you should be able to do that many questions, right? Don't push it to me, you push it to yourself. Okay, if, of course, if you don't study, then there, there will be so little thing you can do, right? Okay, and uh, let's like let's let's talk about personal responsibility. That's something quite rare recently. Right? Okay. Now, but once you know how to punch it on your calculator, oh, that's the notation. Now go back to our calculator. Right. Uh, that will be normal CDF. You go to distribution normal CDF. Lower bound is eighty. Upper bound is one ten. The mean is 100, the standard deviation 15. See, you know what to do already, right? Okay. And that will be 65630, 0. 0. 0. 0.65630. And that's actually the only example I need to give you though. Why? The only new things here is really the mean and standard deviation. That's the only new thing. The lower bound, upper bound is the same to what we learned before. Now, that this is what I meant by it runs really fast because I just need to teach you the basic calculator notation and how to punch it on your calculator. And then from there, you replicate with variations. Okay, now. Let me give you two or three minutes to do, maybe maybe four or five minutes to do the following questions. Find the probability that uh, X is less than equal to 120. And for part C, let me put a line here. And for part C, find the probability that X is greater equals to 130. Hmm. Let me ask you to do that. Again, the mean and standard deviations are 100 for the mean, standard deviation 15. Okay, please, please do this. Uh, two minutes for each. So let's say I will give you the answer at 6.35. Okay, work on that, please. <clears throat> and let's start. The mean is 100. Uh, probability that the random variable is less than equals to 120. Less than equals to means to the left of that. means the interval will be from negative infinity up to 120. <clears throat> now the calculator notation will be normal 
CDF, negative infinity, which we replace by negative E99, upper bound, uh, yeah, upper bound is 120, the mean is 100, standard deviation 15. Okay, so the normal CDF, negative E99, that's the lower bound, upper bound 120. The mean is 100, standard deviation 15, 0 0.90879, 0 0.90879. <clears throat> now, how about the probability that X is greater or equals to 130? Let's sketch the graph first. Now, eventually, after you get used to it, you don't need to sketch the graph anymore. Okay? Yeah. Uh, once you get used to it, you don't need to sketch the graph anymore. But at the beginning, it may be useful to help you visualize that to the right of 130. So the lower bound is 130, the upper bound is infinity. That's normal CDF. Lower bound 130, upper bound E99. The mean is 100, standard deviation 15. Normal CDF, lower bound 130, upper bound E99, E99. The mean is 100, standard deviation 15, 0 0.02275, 0 0.02275. Oh, how about the cutoff score? Part D, find C such that probability that X to be less than equals to C, the probability that the random variable is less than C is let's say 80% which in decimal is 0 0.8. If this is 100, what is that C such that the area to the left of that is 80%? Such that the area to the left of that is 80%. which is 0 0.8. <clears throat> then C is equal to inverse norm. Remember the area, always area to the left, 0 0.8. That's the area to the left. If what you are given is area to the right, then find out what is the area to the left first. Okay, now the mean is 100. The standard deviation is 15. Okay, that's inverse norm. Area to the left, 0 0.8. The mean is 100. Standard deviation, 15. That's 112.62432. It's 
<clears throat> That's how we use our calculator to compute and also how to find the probability. Now let's apply to a problem from our textbook. I think I will just do one problem. Let me do number 39. I hope that's enough problem. Yeah, it's like pretty much all the problems we have here are application from uh, what we learned earlier. It's, we just put it into word problems. So let's see. Therefore, you need to practice though, okay? You need to practice. If you don't practice, you won't get used to it. I promise you that. Okay, number 39, this is again from 7.2. Number 39, the number of chocolate chips in an 18 ounce bag of chips Ahoy chocolate chips cookies is approximately normally distributed. So let X B the number of chocolate chips. Now it says that this X, the number of chocolate chips is approximately normally distributed. <coughs> with mean 1,262, with standard deviation 118. So I put squared here to make it variance. <clears throat> now part A, what is the probability that a randomly selected 18 ounce pack of chocolate chips Ahoy's contain 1,000 to 1,400 chips? probability that the number of chocolate chips will be between 1,000 to 1,400. Between 1,000 to 1,400. So the mean is one, two, six, two. You want between 1,000 to 1,400. Calculator notation, normal CDF. The lower bound is 1,000. Upper bound, 1,400. The mean, 1,262. Standard deviation, 118. That's it. It's really, you just need to write the proper probability notation the calculator notation and how to use calculator. Okay, that's normal CDF, lower bound 1000, upper bound 1400, the mean 1262, standard deviation 118. Okay, that's why you will see, I strongly, strongly recommend you to write this. I strongly recommend you to write this down first. You may think, oh, Thomas, do I have to write it down? Do you realize that writing it, writing this down actually summarize whatever you need to deal with in this question? Instead of going back to the word problem again and again, just think of that from, hey, you know what? That's a normally distributed with this mean, with this standard deviation. Okay. Now then I will press enter to find the result 0 0.86570, 0 0.86570. Yeah, because I round, right? <clears throat> That's for part A, part B. 
what is the probability that a randomly selected 18 ounce bag of chips Ahoy contains fewer than 1,000 chocolate chips? Probability that X is less than 1,000. Means if this is the mean, 1,000 is here and you want less than that. That will be normal CDF, negative infinity. That's the lower bound, upper bound is 1000. Let me move that a little bit. And then the mean is 1,262, standard deviation 118. Normal CDF, <clears throat> lower bound negative E 99, upper bound 1,000. The mean is 1,262, standard deviation 118, already there, boom. 0 0.013193, actually 0 0.1320, 0 0.01320. If I round it to five decimal places. Part C. What proportion of 18 ounce bags of chips Ahoy contains more than 1200 chocolate chips? Probability that X is more than 1200. Let's sketch that again to help us visualize that. The mean is 1262, 1200 is to the left of that, but you need greater than 1200. Then it will be normal CDF, lower bound 1200, upper bound infinity, which I use E99. The mean is 1262, the fairings is 111. <clears throat> then I use my calculator, let me move it here. So normal CDF, lower bound 1200, upper bound E99, the mean is there, standard deviation is already there, enter. 0 0.70036, 0 0.70036. That's for part C. <clears throat> part D. Let me do it here. What proportion of 18 ounce bags of chips a hoist contains fewer than, fewer than 1,125 chocolate chips? But that you, you see that this question is the same to part B, is we just change the number a little bit, right? Okay, so that is to the left of 1125. The mean is 1262. 1125 is to the left of that and we need area to the left. That's normal CDF from negative infinity, negative E99, upper bound 1125. The mean 1262, standard deviation 118. 
that's normal CDF, negative E99 is the lower bound, the upper bound 1125, the mean is there, standard deviation is there. So 0 0.12282. 0 0.12282. Part E, what is the percentile rank of an 18 ounce bag of chips that contains 1,475 chocolate chips? What is the percentile? So basically, if you have, this is the mean one, two, six, two, right? Now then one, four, seven, five is what percentile? Then you ask yourself, uh, what is the probability or what's the portion of 18 ounce bag has less than 1475 chocolate chips? That will give you the percentile. Probability that X is less than equals to 1475. Normal CDF. Negative E99. 1475. The mean is 1262. One, one, eight. Okay, now then let me compute that normal CDF negative E ninety nine one four seven five. The mean is already there, the standard deviation already there. So 0 0.96447, 0 0.96447. Okay, so we say that this is in the 96 percentile. Okay, 96 percentile. It is greater than, uh, there are 96 percent of uh, 18 ounce bag of chips ahoys whose chocolate chips is less than this 1475 chocolate chips. Okay, now part F again, very, very similar. Probability that X, what is the per rank, percentile rank of the bag of chips ahoys that contains 1050? Then let's see what is the proportion less than or equals to 1050. Zero point zero three six one two zero zero point zero three six two zero. Is it two zero? Let me check again. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it is actually at the third percentile. Okay, 
Now I will continue from this 7.2 when we come back uh, next week after your test. Let me see first what you can do at home. Number 23 to number 41. Number 23, so 7.2 B, suggested homework. Number 23 to 41. Now, uh, please do those. And then on Monday, when we come back, I will continue the 7.2. And uh, let me see, is there 7.3? No, I'm not 7.3. Uh, I will skip 7.3, I will skip 7.4, I go to 8.1. So on Monday, when we come back, so this Wednesday, this Wednesday, this Wednesday, we have a test. We have test two, right? So next Monday, we'll finish 7.B2, call that part C. A little bit more, I didn't really finish it. Uh, a very little bit more, and then I go on with 8.1. And from chapter eight, I will only cover 8.1. That's all we need, that's all we need. Okay, so next Wednesday, not this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we'll start chapter seven, uh, chapter nine. And we will stay there for maybe one and a half week. So your test three will be up to chapter nine plus base theorem. Okay, this is where I will stop. See you on Wednesday at 420. Uh, make sure you are online with Zoom. Okay, bye-bye.